the war over education. Shame on you! Shame on you! It's turned schools into culture war battlefields. Beware of terms like social justice, equity, inclusion. How should America teach its children about race, history, and identity? You're teaching children to hate others because of their skin color. You cannot tell me what is or is not racist. Look at me. Plus, a pandemic-fueled plunge in test scores and kids struggling with their mental health. We must go to work for our children. They can't wait. Tonight, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. His election win transformed the politics of education in America. We are the party that knows that parents matter. Now he's taking questions from parents, teachers, and students in a special CNN Town Hall event. Good evening and welcome to War Over Education with Virginia's Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin. I'm Jake Tapper. It is the issue that has become a flashpoint across the country in classrooms, at school board meetings, at the ballot box, communities nationwide reckoning with big questions about parental rights in K-12 classrooms and what children are taught in school. In Virginia, Governor Glenn Youngkin has made education the centerpiece of his successful campaign and his agenda. And tonight, our audience is made up of parents and teachers and students from across the Commonwealth of Virginia who will have the chance to directly question Governor Youngkin about these issues that impact children's futures. So let's get right to it. Please welcome Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. Thank you so much. Good How to see you. you. Thank you so much. How's everybody? How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat, Thank sir, you. if you would. Education is the key issue for you, perhaps more so than any other governor in the country. You ran your campaign on it. You issued your first executive order on it. Why? Why is this issue your main focus? Well, first of all, Jake, I want to say thank you. Thanks to CNN for hosting tonight. And I want to thank all the Virginians that are here. Thanks for coming from all over the Commonwealth and focusing on this most important topic you know, we almost have to step back a little bit and reflect on the fact that uh, Virginia was known to have the best high schools. We have the best colleges, the best universities, uh, ranging all the way from, from uh, Thomas Jefferson High School, which is ranked number one in the country as the best high school, to our, our, our revered HBCUs, to a higher ed system that's ranked uh, top in the country. And yet here we are at ground zero, ground zero in, uh, in the debate and the battle over high schools, colleges, curriculum, parents, the role of teachers. This is Virginia. You know, the big question we always ask is, how did we get here, though? And, you know, you look back to pre-pandemic, and what happened was administrations lowered expectations for children and for schools. And then we got into the pandemic, and parents all of a sudden had a front row seat in their child's education as kitchens and family rooms were transformed into classrooms. And what they saw, they didn't like. They saw the result of lowered expectations. They actually saw, Jake, that what was being taught in the schools was pitting children against one another based on race or sex or religion. And what they also saw were materials that really weren't comfortable for them and consistent with their family values. And then once... Folks went back to school after an extended closure, which was unnecessary in Virginia, in my view. Uh, what happened was masks were mandated and violence in schools went up as school resource officers were barred from being in schools and the behavioral health crisis, crisis escalated and academic performance plummeted. We saw the scores come out over the summer from the National Report Card, otherwise mm -hmm. known as NAEP. And what we saw was Virginia kids suffered more than kids across the country. Fourth graders had the largest learning loss in math, the largest learning loss in reading. And all of a sudden, the fear that so many parents had that schools weren't delivering for their children was realized. Yep. Well, now we find ourselves in a campaign in an election. And we watched Virginians come together, Republicans and Democrats, not Republicans 
versus Democrats. And it was all around a very simple concept. Parents matter. And parents deserve not only to be at the table, but they deserve to have the head seat at the table. And when we had seen, once we got into office, that it was worse than we expected, when we actually saw the fact that many of the things that the left liberal progressives were saying weren't going on in schools, mm -hmm. were actually going on in schools. Yeah. And so we had to go to work right away in order to make a difference. So let's uh, take uh, our first question. I want you to meet Michelle Wingfield, a high school language arts teacher from North Chesterfield. She's a Republican. Michelle. If education is supposed to be such a high priority in Virginia, why are teachers, which, as you know, are so hard to come by right now, so underpaid. As a newly single mother, I can barely afford rent on my salary, even with this being my seventh year teaching. Great. So, Michelle, first of all, I want to thank you for teaching. And uh, I look back on the teachers that had an impact on my life growing up. Uh, Miss Betty Weaver, who was my fourth grade teacher. And I'm just in awe of the great men and women across the Commonwealth who have dedicated themselves to educating our children. And so thank you. Thank you, because I know that there will be somebody along the way who says, you know, I remember my teacher. And it will be you. And you had an impact on their life. And, and so thank you. You know, one of the big challenges that we have across the Commonwealth and across the country is just a horrific shortage in teachers. And the reality is, of course, that historically, teachers, in my view, were underpaid. And it was why I made uh, at the center of our campaign, making sure that we paid teachers more. And I'm proud to say that in, my, in our first year, we, we were able to pay teachers more and deliver on that, on that promise. A 5% raise last year, another 5% raise this year for 10% over a two year period. Um, but we need to do better. And we know that because if we're gonna attract the best and the brightest into teaching, we need to make sure that they can afford to live. They can afford to live in Virginia. And so that's why we went to work over the summer when there was such a shortage in teachers to dedicate $30 million to recruit teachers from across the country, to streamline the licensing transfer process when teachers come from other states, and to make sure that teachers who might have retired and might come back, there won't be, there won't be any blocks to them coming back and teaching again. So in the heart of education is parents. But right behind them are our teachers. And we know that when we have a partnership between parents and teachers, Virginia's kids will thrive. So thank you again for being a teacher. So um, your first executive order uh, ends the teaching of critical race theory, or CRT, in public schools. For those who don't know, uh, critical race theory teaches that racism in the United States is systemic, meaning it's ingrained within the judicial or the healthcare or the school system. So we have a question about CRT from Bach, Brock Barnes. Brock Barnes, a social studies teacher in Augusta County, Virginia, who's an independent. Brock. Brock. In recent years, there's been a lot of debate regarding the teaching of CRT in public schools. As a social studies teacher, I find it imperative to teach history through facts and the perspectives of the people involved in a historical event. Governor Youngkin, what is your view on the difference between teaching CRT in the classroom and the teaching of historical injustices such as slavery and segregation and the impact it's had on Americans? Yeah, thank you for that great question. Thanks for coming all the way uh, to be with us tonight. And, and again, thank you for being a teacher. And again, the role that teachers play in our kids' lives is invaluable. And for anyone watching tonight who might be inspired to be a teacher, come be a teacher in Virginia. Uh, teaching our history is critical. And I have said all along that our, our standard should be to teach all of it, the good and the bad. And we can't walk away from our history because there have been just incredibly, incredibly difficult, challenging, dark times in our history as a commonwealth and as a nation. And that's why when... When I laid out my key objectives for our history standards, it was doing exactly that, teaching all of our history, the good and the bad. I'm pleased with our history standards because I think they will be the best in the nation. We, in fact, enhanced the discussion of slavery and made sure that everyone understood for the first time in Virginia history standards that the cause of the Civil War was slavery. 
And the, and the teaching of that basic fact is critical. You know, recently, I had the great privilege of going on a field trip with fourth graders from Mary S. Peak Elementary School. And we went to Fort Monroe. If anybody hasn't been to Fort Monroe, you should go because extraordinary things happened at Fort Monroe. Of course, with the fourth graders, we learned together and discussed the fact that while Fort Monroe was a, was a Union fort during the Confederacy, something extremely important happened there more than 400 years before. And that was the beginning of slavery in the United States. In 1619, the first enslaved Africans were brought to the colonies, to America. Mm -hmm. And it happened right there at Point Comfort. And we had a chance to talk about this with fourth graders. And we had a chance to talk about the fact that enslaved people were brought here against their will and how horrific that was. But we also had a chance to talk about what happened more than 200 years after that, during the Civil War, when brave individuals gave refuge to slaves and brought, and brought freedom to so many people at Fort Monroe. What a rich discussion it is. And so I think we need to make sure that we are teaching all of our history, the good and the bad. But the key point yeah. is how we teach it. Right. We need to teach it honestly and transparently, but we shouldn't teach it with judgment. And one of, one of the clear realities is that what had crept into our school systems were divisive concepts, divisive concepts that had curriculum and materials that were forcing our children to judge one another. So let me exactly ask you about that, which is kind of following up on what Brock was asking, because your, your executive order that ended the teaching of CRT said that it would end the teaching of inherently divisive uh, yes. concepts, including CRT. So other than CRT, can you give us a specific example of what is an inherently divisive concept that you think should not be taught in Virginia schools? Yeah, the, inherent, the inherently divisive concepts are taken directly from the Civil Rights Act. And they're teaching children that they're inherently biased or racist because of their race or their sex or their religion. Uh, they teach that a child is guilty for sins of the past because of their race or their religion or their sex. They teach that a child is, is oppressed or a victim because of their race, their religion, or their sex. And of course, we've seen this in curriculum. You see, critical race theory isn't a class that's taught. It's something that is, it's a philosophy that's incorporated in the curriculum. So, and we saw it in Fairfax County with, with, with privilege bingo and right. games like this. But we also saw it in teacher training and professional development in recommended books entitled Critical Race Theory. And so this is why it was so important for us to clearly define what was not going to be taught in schools and what was. Because this is a chance to make sure that we're not pitting our children against one another based on race or religion or their sex, but yeah. teaching all history, the good and the bad. So let me just ask you one more follow-up on that, which is what do you say to a teacher who wants to teach any one of any number of scholars who say that the condition of black Americans today can be traced all the way back to Fort Monroe in 1619. That it's not as if every generation is just brought, for, brought forth new. Uh, that there, there were hundreds of years of slavery, a hundred years of Jim Crow, and today is part of that. Yeah, well, I, 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 first of all, we must step back and teach all of that. And then we have to recognize where we are today. And see, I think the opportunity for us today is to recognize that there are students who need extra help. And there are students who can soar right where they are. And we have to teach to both. And one of the challenges of today's world of, of equal outcomes for all students at any cost is that we, in fact, are holding all students down. And that's why I have I've been so consistent you know, we can raise the ceiling and we can raise the floor and we can teach our children where they are. We can provide opportunities for those students to run as fast as they possibly can and we need to provide extra resources for those students and those schools that need them. And the reality is that's something that we went to work on right out of the box. And that's why in my first session, we passed the Virginia Literacy Act 
in order to focus on K through third reading and provide reading coaches for those schools and students yeah. that need them. And we're doing the same thing in math now. I have another member of a faculty here, uh, Tyron Barnes. He's a high school band director from Fairfax. He's a Democrat. I Mr. Barnes. Governor Yunkin, do you agree that there is an unspoken culture of racism and implicit bias against teachers of color within school districts nationwide? So, so I believe racism exists. And racism has existed for, for centuries and thousands of years. And we should condemn it. And, you know, my faith teaches me first to love God above all other things and then to love each other as he loves us. And I think it is imperative that there's no room for racism. There's no room for bias. There's no room for harassment in our schools or in our communities. I also believe that we have an opportunity to come together as Virginians and as Americans and to lock arms and say, we're going to look forward and we are going to create opportunity. We are, going to, we are going to educate our children to go take that opportunity. And we can lift up all Virginians. See, what we've found ourselves in a moment where we're allowing ourselves to be pitted against one another in all things. And we, we all of a sudden find that everything has to be viewed through a lens of race. I don't think we should ignore our past. I think we should know it. I don't think we should pretend that racism doesn't exist because it does. But how we move forward is up to us. And I think there's an opportunity for us to put down the accusations and put down the judgment and move together in a way that lifts up all people. So we've all heard about the pilot advanced placement or AP African American studies class, uh, which it's become a national order because the governor of Florida banned it. You've ordered a review of this pilot program. Um, what are your specific concerns about it? Well, I don't have any specific concerns other than under my executive order one, I want to make sure that there aren't inherently divisive concepts that are used in the teaching of this AP course. And so I just asked our Department of Education to do exactly what executive order number one asks us to do on all of our curriculum. And, and I have no reason to believe, given the changes that I know have been made to that course, um, that it won't be a fine course for Virginia, but I have to let our Department of Education do their job. This is what I've asked them to do, and I look forward to getting the report back. So here's a parent I want you to meet, uh, Thomas Britton, a father and physicist from Newport News. Earlier this year, uh, a six-year-old student shot a teacher in Newport News, and it's in Thomas's son's classroom, uh, and Thomas is a Democrat. Sir. Since the start of the year, Virginia has had two incidents of six-year-olds bringing guns to school, one of which led to my son's teacher being shot. Since 2021, there have been hundreds of weapons confiscated on school property. What concrete measures are being taken to protect both students and staff at, in our schools? Yeah. Thomas, thank you. And, and, and thank you for bringing up what is just an incredibly difficult topic for all of us. Uh, what happened with a six-year-old bringing a gun to school and then shooting his teacher is just extraordinary. And all of us find, our, find ourselves in a moment as a parent, I'm a parent of four, wondering how that can happen and how do we keep our children safe. You see, Virginia has some of the, some of the toughest gun laws in the country. And what we continue to find is that um, those gun laws don't keep us safe because it's not laws that keep us safe. It's the behavior of people that we need to make sure that we are paying attention to. Parents have a responsibility to keep guns out of their young children's hands, and they need to be held accountable for that. And on top of that, coming out of the pandemic, we have an extraordinary behavioral health crisis across the Commonwealth and across the nation. See, coming out of the pandemic, I think our children were put in circumstances that they had never yet, they'd never yet experienced, loneliness, isolation. And before we know it, we see the behavioral health cry, crisis rep, uh, representing itself in our young people worse than almost any other generation. And that's why it's been so important for us to move forward with an aggressive transformation of Virginia's behavioral health system. You see... Our health system can't keep up with the demand. The behavioral health crisis has put such an extensive burden on the system that we have to transform it. And that means that 
In our plan, which we call Right Help Right Now, we proposed investing nearly $250 million in order to create capacity in schools, with counselors, with telemedicine, to create capacity with mobile crisis units and, and, and crisis receiving units, and to provide capacity after a crisis so that there's a place for people to go. We have a question on mental health yeah. in, in, that, that well, we'll get to in a little bit, but I do just to follow up on what Thomas was asking about, if I may. Um, what about individuals who say there are laws that could help law enforcement keep guns out of the hands of people who would use them for harm? You could strengthen the red flag laws in Virginia. You could require by law parents to lock their guns either in safes or with trigger locks, and that would keep a six-year-old from being able, much less two six-year-olds, from being able to, to get guns and bring them to school. Would you ever contemplate anything like that? Well, let me, let me repeat. Um, yeah. As I said, Virginia has some of the toughest gun laws in the nation, and we have red flag laws, and we have requirements that parents keep guns out of the hands of young children. The reality is, if people don't follow the law, then the laws aren't as powerful as they otherwise could be. Your safe this, storage law is kind of and, weak. And, well, this is, this is the challenge that we've yeah. got, right? Which is, which is, at the end of the day, we, in fact, need parents to take ownership for what they're doing. And we need to also make sure that we are addressing some of the crisis in the family and the crisis in behavioral health that is putting people in a position where they want to cause harm to themselves or to others. We can't dismiss the behavioral health issue. We just can't. No, no, no. We have questions on it later yeah, on. Yeah, and we can't. And, and at, the, at the heart of this is the fact that our behavioral health crisis is showing up in the workplace, it's showing up in schools, it's showing up at home. Yeah. And people are taking their own lives and hurting others. So we're going to take a quick break. Up next, two critical issues in Virginia schools right now, gender identity and the rights of parents in classrooms. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to a CNN Town Hall on Education with Virginia Governor uh, Glenn Youngkin. Uh, Governor, I want you to meet Guinevere Kay. She's a nurse practitioner and a mother of two girls from McLean, Virginia. She's a lifelong Republican who recently became a Democrat. Ms. Kay. School-wide testing was very revealing in that lower math and reading scores were affected by the COVID shutdown. The whole world was behind on reading and math. Why aren't we providing free, on-site, after-school tutoring to every kid who needs it automatically? Why not recruit retired teachers or retired anyone to provide this much-needed service? Great. Thank you for that great question. And you just wrote my executive order from last August. <laughs> and so thank you. I also want to say thanks for being a nurse. My, my mom was a nurse. And she actually was a nurse practitioner as well. So I know your heart uh, and welcome. your heart's for people. <laughs> um, so we, we, we have a tremendous learning loss. Uh, and it was worse than we thought. And one of the big challenges, of course, is that it started prior to the pandemic when expectations and standards were lowered for all Virginia kids and sadly, they met those lowered expectations. And in fact, during the pandemic, when schools were closed for an extended period of time, kids lost even more. And the NAEP scores and our SOL scores show this. They show that, as I said earlier, that our fourth graders had the largest learning loss in the nation in math and in reading. And in fact, for our black families and our Hispanic families, it was disproportionately worse. So we went to work immediately, and we did exactly the things that you pointed out. One is how do we provide tutoring? And so we, we enabled a free tutoring service through schoolhouse.org for parents to come. We just announced $30 million in micro grants for parents to apply for grants for special tutoring services for their children. We worked hard to bring more teachers back in and our opening of a teacher pipeline from other states to, to make the licensing requirements easier, in addition to $30 million in recruitment money, were critical. The bottom line is that we've got to make up lost ground. Two decades of progress was lost, and we've got to go fix this. You know, the reality is that it starts all the way, it starts all the way through K through 12, 
but we also see it almost the worst in our younger children. And if they don't catch up, then they're in for a lifetime of challenges. That's why I was so excited about the Virginia Literacy Act that we passed last year on a bipartisan basis. We're, we're standardizing the way we teach reading in Virginia, the science of reading. We may have known it as phonics when we were growing up, but all teachers will be taught the same way on how to use instruction and materials as well as parents. And we're, through my budget proposals, going to extend that to 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. This is a critical time for us to not lose a generation. And that's why we have been so proactive to make sure that extra learning opportunities, extra funding, more teachers are made available to students all across Virginia. Yeah, very important question, Guinevere. Thank you. We had a Republican mom from Virginia who wanted to ask you a question about new guidelines for transgender students. But for family reasons, she had to, she had to cancel. She can't be here tonight. So let me ask you, can you just explain your transgender policies and what you're trying to achieve with them? Yeah, I can. This is, this is a really important topic for us to discuss because it's a tough one. It's a tough one. And it starts with my belief that we have to love one another. We have to deeply respect one another. And so that's where our policy starts, respecting all students. There's no room for bullying. There's no room for harassment. And we specifically identify that more than 30 times in our policy. But our number one priority is to make sure after students are safe, that their parents are involved in their lives. These are difficult, difficult decisions. And parents want to be engaged in their children's lives, and they have a right to be engaged in their children's lives. And their children should have a parent involved in their life. That is the heart of our policy, is that parents should know what's going on in their children's lives and have a role. And when they do, then, in fact, they can tackle these, these difficult decisions together as a family. So, Governor, I want, you, I want to bring in Nico, a 17-year-old student from Arlington. Nico? Uh, Governor Youngkin, your transgender model policies require that students play on the sports teams and use the restrooms that correspond with their sex assigned at birth. Look at me. I am a transgender man. Do you really think that the girls in my high school would feel comfortable sharing a restroom with me? Yeah, so first of all, Nico, thank you for, again, asking the question, being here tonight and uh, engaging in this important discussion. I believe first, when parents are engaged with their children, then you can make good decisions together. And I met your dad and I'm glad that you're both here together. That's really, really important. I also think that there are lots of students involved in this decision. And what's, what's most important is that we try very hard to accommodate students that's why I have said many, many times, we just need extra bathrooms in schools. We need gender neutral bathrooms. And so people can use a bathroom that they in fact are comfortable with. I think sports are very clear and I don't think it's controversial. I don't think that biological boys should be playing sports with biological girls. Uh, there's been decades of efforts in order to gain opportunities for women in sports and it's just not fair. Um, and I think that's pretty, that's, that's non-controversial and something that I think is, is pretty well understood. Um, again, I think these are very difficult discussions and I am very, very glad to see you and your dad here together. There are obviously a lot of different views on this topic and you've said it should be up to parents, but it's not that simple, right? Because Nico's dad assuredly feels different than, than the Republican mom that was supposed to be here earlier. In that case, which parent do you go with? Well, I don't think it's that hard when we start with the basic principle that parents matter. And, you know, there are parents who have unfortunately been on the other side of not being told what was going on in their child's life. And, and uh, I believe that Sage's grandmother is here tonight. She's over there. And, uh, hi. And, of course, what happened in Sage's life was that uh, counselors and teachers didn't tell Sage's family about the fact that, that she was transgender. And she got caught up in some horrific uh, human trafficking issues and, and they almost lost her. And they didn't, they didn't know. See, there's a basic rule here, which is that children belong to parents, not to the state, not to schools, not to bureaucrats, but to parents. And that's where the first step has to be. So I, I don't doubt that, that Sage's grandmother and Nico's dad are, are wonderful, but not every parent is supportive, especially when it comes to LGBT 
LGBTQ students, especially when it comes to transgender students? Then what? Well, again, I, I, I believe firmly that parents have a right to be engaged in their children's lives, and parents want to be engaged in children's lives, and a child does want their parent. This is a moment for counselors and teachers and parents to come together and deal with what is a difficult issue, but they should do it together. Let's bring in James Miller, an actuary and former high school teacher from Ashburn, Virginia. He's a Republican. James? Hi, James. Thank you. My wife and I are residents of Loudoun County. Our oldest graduated from public school, and we currently have two children in our local public schools. We can't afford private school, and my wife and I are unable to homeschool. So what would you say, what hope can you give to parents like my wife and I who want our kids to get a good education in a safe environment, free of political agenda, left or right, when our local school system has frequently made the news for failing at each of those things. Yeah. So, so first of all, again, thank you for having been a teacher. And, uh, and I think that what we've seen in Loudoun County is really uh, representative of all of the issues that we've been talking about tonight. And that is a school district that in, embraced equity, embraced uh, 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 divisive concepts and teaching, and parents saw it and stood up and said, wait a minute, time out. And then it was coupled with the fact that there was a young woman who was sexually assaulted in a school. And the superintendent moved that child without telling the families to another school. And another young woman was sexually assaulted. You know, it took a new governor, an executive order, an attorney general and Jason Miara's investigation for nine months in order to get an indictment of what was a cover-up. See, there's a basic truth that I believe that school boards and superintendents and administrators need to be held to. One is that parents matter. Transparency is critical. And they do have a responsibility to tell parents and to tell the police when there has been crime, violent crime. This issue is, is at the heart of why we as as, uh, as administration worked so hard to pass bills to make it mandatory that, in fact, a violent crime is reported to police and can't be covered up again, just like it was. We're working hard in order to make sure that curriculum in schools is robust and teaches our children how to think, not what to think. We're working hard to make sure that schools are safe by, by reinserting school resource officers back into the school system and funding them. We're working hard to make sure that expectations are returned to being the best in the nation from being, having been taken down to the worst. And we're working hard to make sure that we have an accountability system for our schools that just recognizes when a school is underperforming, we can bring resources to help because looking at our NAEP scores and our SOL scores, every school in Virginia cannot, cannot pass accreditation. We've got work to do. And we're working hard to make sure that you can trust the public yeah. school systems. And that is at the top of our agenda. I need a school bill is what I need. Up next <laughs> for the break. So up next, artificial intelligence in the classroom. Should it be banned? Should it be embraced? Stay with us. Welcome back to our CNN Town Hall with Virginia's Republican Governor, uh, Glenn Youngkin. Uh, we have lots of questions for you, but first, I do want to ask you, one of the big issues educators are facing right now is the growth of artificial intelligence, such as chat GPT. Uh, things that, these computers can do things such as write essays. They yeah. can solve math problems. Some school districts in Virginia, such as Fairfax County Schools, they've essentially banned it. Yeah. Um, do you think more Virginia schools should, should ban ChatGPT. Yeah, I think they should. And, and I, I think we should just be clear about what our goal of education is, which is to make sure that our kids can think. And therefore, if, some, if a machine is thinking for them, then we're not accomplishing our goal. And uh, yeah, I do think that it's something to be very careful of. And I do think more, more school districts should ban it. Interesting. So uh, we have another student here tonight. Um, there are a lot of kids in Virginia around the country and in Virginia, who rely on public schools to get their nutrition for the day, yeah. as you know. On that topic, I want to turn to Taylin Hoover-Smith, an eighth grade student from Yorktown. Taylin. Hi. Nice to see you. Hi. What can we do to improve school lunches, both in the amount of food and the variety that we get at middle school? I skip lunch so that my parents won't have to pay for a small snack. 
that is lunch for me. I know my friends do the same. It's just not enough food. Yeah. So um, I, too, find that, that, uh, that, that as I travel around Virginia, one of the things I hear most about from parents is about food and the quality of food. And, and food insecurity is an extraordinary problem right now. We have the greatest uh, sense of insecurity uh, with food in, in, the, in Virginia than we've ever had. And for so many students, that meal at school and with programs, a breakfast as well, is their best chance to get a good meal every day. And so I think we start with, I think we start with recognizing that local schools have su su substantial funding and we need to make sure that they're putting it to work. Uh, and that from the state level that we set guidelines on what should be served in school. Um, you know, the, the school environment provides us an opportunity uh, to really support families across Virginia and to support them in lots of ways. I've been deeply engaged with the schools in Petersburg over the, over the last many months through a partnership that we struck with the state government in Petersburg in order to really address a whole host of issues um, that have plagued Petersburg for a long time. But what we found was wraparound services in the school, from medical care to nutrition um, to tutoring to, to simply engaging with children uh, made a huge difference. And so I'm excited about the opportunities that our schools can provide for families. I know Thank this you. is a topic that we're coming to right now that you really want to talk about. This is Esther Pierre Seuss. She's from Virginia Beach. She's an assistant principal at a high school. She's an independent. Esther. I live in Virginia Beach, but I do work on the eastern shore for Arcadia High School Great. in Accomack County. So I wanted to clear that up. All right. I appreciate it. Yes. Fact so <laughs> as an assistant principal, I wanted to ask you, this is a big concern at Arcadia High School and um, a lot of rural schools around uh, Virginia. How can we better help students who are struggling with mental health issues that go beyond the resources we have in schools? Yeah, no. So thank you for that most important question. Uh, thanks for making the compute, commute across the bridge uh, and going yes. to the Eastern Shore. Can you lower the toll? Uh, <laughs> Just for her. Just let me, for her. Let me look into it. Just for me. Yeah. <laughs> Just for um, me. <laughs> and, and, you know, really our rural schools face a lot of the same issues that some of our urban schools face as well, which is shortage of teachers, challenges with cost of living, challenges of, of making sure that we have schools fully staffed. But at the top of the list right now are challenges around behavioral health. And, and as I said earlier, we've seen our behavioral health system overwhelmed. We've seen it overwhelmed because of the challenges that families are dealing with, students are dealing with coming out of the pandemic. We've seen record levels of, of teen contemplated suicide. We've seen self-harm. We've seen this present itself not just in schools, but at home and, yes, in the workplace. And so this is why our behavioral health transformation is so important. And we identified this on day one. We started working on day one on a transformation program that would provide more resources, more resources pre-crisis so that folks can find help when they need it, not when they're in crisis. And we've, we've funded in through our budget proposals this year, more counselors into schools and utilizing uh, telehealth and telemedicine so that students and families can get help immediately. We've also wanted to make sure that our, our, our institutions of higher education are resourced as well because, of course, our college students are seeing similar challenges. This is a moment for us to put politics down and to recognize that the behavioral health challenge in Virginia and America is one that doesn't pay attention to Republicans or Democrats. It doesn't pay attention to your income level. It doesn't pay attention to your race or religion. This is a problem that is we're seeing overwhelm our systems. And that's why I'm excited about our new program called Right Help Right Now. We're getting moving to make sure that we bring resources across the Commonwealth so we can address this most challenging issue. I want you to meet another student. I'm really excited about the students here. You guys are very, very yeah, brave. Great. So good to get great. Um, this is Callie Walsh, a high school student from Alexandria. She volunteers with an advocacy group called Generation Ratify. Callie. Hi, Callie. House Bill 1448 appeared during this legislative session and would have forced the Department of Education to make recommendations on the adoption of model policies for the selection and removal of public school library materials. While this legislation did not pass during session, 
What is your stance on the removal of books from school libraries, and how would you act if a piece of legislation similar to this one came across your desk in the future? Yeah, so Holly, thank you for that uh, most important topic. Um, so my, my whole approach to this starts with parents and transparency to make sure that parents know what's in the library and parents understand what materials are being used in the curriculum. And so last year, we were able to pass a bill on a bipartisan basis that gave parents full visibility into materials in the classroom. And if those are sexually explicit materials that aren't consistent with family values, then a parent can request a replacement, a replacement material into their child's curriculum. See, I do believe that there's moments where we have to make decisions about what's age appropriate and what is appropriate. And those are hard decisions, but we shouldn't run away from them. We should engage in them. And these are healthy discussions for us to have. What books should be in an elementary school library? Should they have explicit pictures in them or not? Well, I don't think there should, they should be there. And these are decisions that I think we should take on as opposed to run away from. And therefore, had that bill passed, I would have signed it. Um, and then we would have engaged with communities not, not, not in a strong-handed way, but in an engaged way to listen and discuss and make good decisions for our kids. I want to ask you about an issue uh, that's gotten a lot of national attention uh, from Virginia. Last year, some Virginia schools failed to notify quickly National Merit commended students yeah. of their recognition. At your request, the Virginia Attorney General is now investigating this. Have you seen anything indicating that these administrators did this intentionally, as has been implied, to avoid hurting the students' feelings who did not make that honor. Have you seen yeah. evidence of that? Yeah, well, the, the, the attorney general's investigation is still going on, and so I can't comment specifically on, on those facts. But, but of course, what was, what was suggested and communicated um, by senior officials in schools was exactly that, that they had held back uh, notifying students of their national merit commendation, because they didn't want other students to feel bad. And this was more than just one case. Next thing you know, we, we, have, we have over 16 or 17 schools across one school district that this was happening in. The reality is that, that when a school hires consultants to come in and teach equity for all students, equal outcomes for all students at any cost, we end up with these kinds of circumstances. We have to celebrate excellence. We shouldn't embrace equity at the expense of excellence. Students work hard. They, should, they receive these kinds of accolades. Their parents and their kids should know. Yeah. They should know. I want you to meet Jessica Diacon. She's a Republican from Waynesboro. Uh, she and she's standing with her daughter. Um, Jessica lost her 15-year-old son in 2021 to fentanyl. Uh, she recently met with your wife at the governor's mansion and is working to tell her son's story. It's a tragic story. It's an awful story. We hear it increasingly, unfortunately, across the country. Jessica. Thank you. Why is there no Narcan available in the school systems where we live? Oh, Jessica. I am, uh, first of all, I'm just so terribly sorry for your loss. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a father of four, and I, I cannot imagine the pain that you've gone through in your family. And, and so... The First Lady and I have been so focused on this issue that uh, we have seen overdoses and poisonings go through the roof um, as we have a true epidemic and the free flow of drugs across our southern border has, makes Virginia a border state. You know, for those folks who, who don't know, our, our overdoses have doubled. And over 75% of them are, are from fentanyl. And this is something that we all have to wake up to, that we have to recognize that one pill can kill. And whether it was taken purposely or taken by accident, no one wants to die. No one chooses to die. We have an incredible uh, uh, antidote or, or, or treatment for this, which is Narcan. And I would encourage everybody to go through Narcan training. Uh, I've gone through it. It's easy, it's important and you can get certified very quickly. Uh, and we just uh, put into our budget to get past funding to make sure that we can fully fund Narcan supplies across the Commonwealth of Virginia. The federal funding has run out. 
And I want to replace that with state funding to make sure that there are not schools, there are not places across the Commonwealth of Virginia that don't have a supply of Narcan. Thank you for sharing with Thank us. Thank you for, that, for telling your story. That's incredibly important that everybody, every parent be aware of that because it's not people necessarily taking fentanyl. Somebody might think it's a, it's a legal herbal supplement yeah. and there's fentanyl in it and it's just a teeny trace that can kill you. Uh, coming up, we're going to have more with Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, who is term limited. So does he have any future plans to run for any other office? <laughs> Town Hall with Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin of Virginia is here with us talking about uh, education. And, you know, we've heard tonight from parents, we've heard from teachers, we've heard from faculty, we've heard from two high school students and one middle school student. Yeah. Uh, incredible. Um, and just actually just for the kids, I want to ask you, um, we're talking about K through 12 education. Uh, you, ha you have been a high school parent for more than a decade. Uh, your youngest is a senior in high school. You grew up in Virginia. You played basketball in high school. Did you like high school? Yeah, I loved high school. I loved high school. You know, I, but you have those there moments. Is, by, by the way, there, there, yeah. there, there. Yeah. Ah, boy, look at that. I made that shot. Um, but you, you have these moments during your, during your education you remember vividly. And I remember fourth grade. Miss Betty Weaver was my teacher at Watkins Elementary in Midlothian, Virginia. And, and Mrs. Weaver believed in me. And I, I might have not been trying very hard. She was tough. And she inspired me to try harder. And uh, after my dad lost his job, we moved down to Virginia Beach, and I was at Lynn Haven, now middle school, but junior high school at the time, and I had a pretty good basketball game. And uh, somebody recruited me to come play basketball at a private school called Norfolk Academy, and it changed my life. It was such an opportunity. I'm going to go back to, There's you know, the assistant I had choice. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I had choice. It was amazing. And, and Pat Hume, in ninth grade, gave me my very first C, and she woke me up. And she said, you can do a lot better if you try a lot harder. Basketball opened up all kinds of doors for me. It gave me a college scholarship to study mechanical engineering. I was telling folks earlier, I wanted to be an astronaut. Now, they didn't tell you that at 6'6", you're not going up in a rocket. <laughs> um, but it was an extraordinary benefit of this sport that, uh, that really carried me a long way. I loved school. Uh, and I look back, and I'm envious of all of you who are in school now. And I just, again, want to thank the students here tonight. You guys have been great, so thank you. Yeah. So, for me, uh, English with Mrs. Weisgrau, history uh, with Doc Gorvine, my favorite subjects, um, two of my favorite teachers. What was your favorite subject? My, I was a science guy, and uh, I loved science all the way up through college. Uh, but it's amazing, the two teachers I remember... Um, weren't my science teachers, they were my general studies teacher in fourth grade, and then Mrs. Hume in English. And I probably was pressed the hardest and learned the most from folks that may have seen something in me that I didn't see and challenged me. Uh, and so, yes, for those teachers that are here tonight, I'll repeat what I said earlier. There's going to be students that will remember you forever. And so thank you for changing lives. And he's clearly also saying, give more C's. Give more C's. <laughs> I'm just joking, kids, three kids. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm joking about that. I want you to meet Michael McCabe. He's a high school math teacher from Sterling, Virginia. He's a former Foreign Service officer and a Republican. Michael. Thank you for being here, Governor. Um, in our school and in other Virginia schools, we say the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of each day. Yet, we cannot require the students to say the pledge, to stand, to pay attention, or to do anything except stop walking and be quiet. The people actually saying the pledge are most teachers and a few students. So why not eliminate the requirement to say the pledge in Virginia schools? I like the Pledge of Allegiance. I think it's really important for us to remember that there are ideals that formed this nation. You know, it's not a geography. It was a nation that was formed by an idea. And, and that's why I'm so focused on the fact that our history standards need to tell all of our history, the good and the bad, but also need to tell the full story of America from its founding all the way through, from our founding documents, which are critical for us to understand. You know, we were a nation that was founded by imperfect men, a nation that is in pursuit of a more perfect union. And it's getting better and better and better every year. Um, 
This is, a, this is about, I think, recognizing that America is exceptional. We've had some terribly dark, dark moments, but it's exceptional. You know, I have to say that this moment of standing up for our Constitution and standing up for our Declaration of Independence is something that I don't think should be controversial. You know, just recently, one of my appointments to the state school board stood up in a school board meeting and advocated that we should teach about our Constitution and we should teach about our Declaration of Independence. And all of a sudden, there was an effort made by left liberal Democrats to smear her and remove her. And they did just that, just recently. And that's, that's Saparna Dutta, who's here with us tonight. And Saparna, I want to thank you for your service to Virginia. This, this shouldn't be controversial. We should embrace our history, all of it, the good and the bad. We should understand where we've come from. We should understand our founding documents. And yes, we should say the Pledge of Allegiance. So your commonwealth is a little bit wacky in the sense that you term limit your governors after one term. They're only allowed to serve for one term. And it, well, you can do it to one consecutive term. So I do have to ask you, Governor, you pulled off a surprise, come from behind, upset victory in a state, a commonwealth that a lot of people thought was pretty solidly blue. Maybe it's purple now. You are term limited. Are you giving any thought to running for higher office, such as president? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for that, uh, that humbling question. You know, I, I just have to say that you know, 40 years ago, I was in Virginia Beach and I was washing dishes and taking out trash at the Belvedere coffee shop. And I had an extraordinary opportunity with great education and people who took interest in, in my professional career. And I thought I was uh, in my dream job when I had a chance to take over a firm that, uh, that I'd worked at for 25 years. And then I found myself with this real clear view that Virginia was heading in the wrong direction. And Maybe there was a different way to do this. Maybe there was a way to bring people together around common sense, bring people together around values that aren't that controversial. We just need to express them clearly to one another and get moving. And I've been so pleased by the fact that all the things we campaigned on, we accomplished. I have a big job. I love my job. Thank you for hiring me. Thank you for letting me come to work every day and go to work for 8.7 million Virginians. That's where my focus is right now. And I believe there's an enormous amount of work yet to do in Virginia. We've got a budget to negotiate. We've got a lot of work still to do in education. And uh, every morning I, I wake up and I thank the Lord for putting me there. I ask him for help. And then I go to work with a spring in my step. And so again, thank you for hiring me. Yeah. Until the end there, it sounded like a yes uh, on the president thing, but, but you, ha you certainly haven't ruled it out, is what I'm saying here. No? Well, I, I have to say, I'm, uh, let's see, Jake, I'm, I'm not writing a book. Right. Okay, so <laughs> that's right. In fact, the book that I'm, I'm hoping to write is, is the book we're talking about right now, Playbook for Education. That's the playbook we should all write together that, that recognizes the most important thing that we are focused on is the education of our children. You know, when our children gain the skills, gain the confidence, gain the capabilities to aspire, set goals, and dream, and then go chase them, well, then we know we've been successful. We have a long way to go, but I am so proud of what we've done in our first year, and all it does is raise the bar and want me to get more done faster in our second year so that we don't lose a generation of kids and that Virginia can return to what she once was, which was a place where people came from all over the world to come to Virginia for our schools, for our great K through 12, for our great universities. This is what we should collectively aspire for. And I can't wait to work with all of you to help bring it about. I want to thank the parents. I want to thank the teachers and faculty. Most importantly, I want to thank the three brave students we have here. And I want to thank everybody here. I also want to thank uh, Governor Glenn Youngkin for joining us thank tonight. You. Thank, thank you so much. CNN Tonight with Allison Camerata starts right now.